Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. In episode 92 of Trace Evidence, we documented the case of nine-year-old Christine Jessup. In October of 1984, she disappeared from the streets of Queensville, Ontario, Canada. Christine's remains were found months later on December 31st, kicking an abduction investigation into that of a murder. After a massive search and missing persons campaign, police locked in on a local resident, eventually charging him with the crime. DNA evidence would later clear him of any involvement. Now, some 36 years later, DNA has given authorities the name of Christine's killer. It's a name that was never mentioned in the initial investigation, prompting many to wonder how investigators could have missed the suspect, and whether or not their focus on their first suspect clouded the investigation itself. As it turns out, the killer was known to the family, had been involved in the searches, and even attended Christine's funeral. Much of his life remains a mystery, one which investigators are determined to solve, perhaps to answer the question of why, and determine whether or not there could be more victims out there. This is a Trace Evidence Case Update. The abduction and murder of Christine Jessup has been solved. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the details surrounding the recent identification of Christine Jessup's killer and the known information surrounding that investigation. Without further delay, let's move into the case. On the morning of Wednesday, October 3rd, 1984, nine-year-old Christine Jessup was getting ready to go to school. Christine lived in Queensville, a small town in Ontario, Canada, with her parents and brother. Her older brother, Kenny, had a dentist appointment that morning, and so Christine, who would normally come home to find her brother or parents waiting, instead would be taking the bus and coming home alone. This wasn't the first time Christine had come home and had to let herself in, and reportedly in the past she had done so without issue, proving herself to be reliable and mature enough to follow the procedure. According to everything we know about her day, school went generally according to plan. Christine, who attended nearby Queensville Public School, received a recorder, a small plastic woodwind-style instrument from the flute family in school that day. Multiple people would later report seeing Christine playing with the instrument which she had her name attached to. While in school, Christine began talking with her good friend, Leslie Chipman, and the two made plans to get together after school. The plan was simple. After riding the bus home, Christine was supposed to head back to her house, drop off her school supplies, grab up some of her dolls, and then head over to a nearby park to play with Leslie. Unfortunately, Christine would never arrive at the park, and what exactly occurred would become one of the most haunting and difficult mysteries in Canadian history. Christine was noted as having stepped off the school bus sometime between 3.40 and 4 p.m. at her normal stop, which was located on Leslie Street, just north of the town's main street. Kenny and Christine's mother, Janet, arrived back at the family home following the dentist appointment sometime between 4.10 and 4.20, somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes after Christine should have gotten home. Upon their arrival, the two found several signs indicating that Christine, at a minimum, had made it home from school that day. The mail had been brought inside, and Christine's backpack was found on the kitchen counter beside it. Now, neither Kenny nor Janet knew anything was wrong at the time, but they did see one thing which piqued their curiosity. Christine had a bike, which has been described as her pride and joy. She loved the bike and treated it very well. According to Janet, when Christine was done with her bike, she would always put the kickstand down and ensure the bike was secured. However, on this day, Christine's bike was found lying near the family's home front door. This didn't immediately inspire panic for the family, but it was noted as being somewhat bizarre and out of character for the nine-year-old. While the Jessup family were settling in, Leslie Chipman was growing concerned. Christine's friend had arrived home and sat down to watch television, killing some time before the two were set to meet. Around 4 p.m., Leslie left her home, dolls in tow, 
heading down to the park, but Christine wasn't there. Leslie apparently sat at the park waiting for Christine for 10 minutes before growing frustrated. She made the short walk home, picked up the phone, and called the Jessup residence wondering where Christine was. The initial call was placed at approximately 4.10 p.m., wedged right between the time when Christine should have gotten home and when her brother and mother would later arrive. At this time, Leslie received no answer. She tried again 10 minutes later at 4.20, and this time Kenny answered. Leslie was asking for Christine, explaining their plans, but Kenny told her that Christine wasn't home. At the time, no one knew anything was wrong. It was assumed that Christine had gone out to play and either was at the park, having arrived after Leslie left, or maybe decided to stop off somewhere. A few hours later, when Christine still hadn't arrived home, Janet began worrying. Dinner had passed, and it was highly unusual of Christine to miss the meal. Janet began calling friends and neighbors, but no one had seen the nine-year-old. Hoping that Christine had just become distracted, Kenny and Janet went out looking for her, going around the area and even stopping at the park, but there was no sign of the nine-year-old. Finally, at 7 p.m., Janet called the police. The York Regional Police took the investigation and immediately began canvassing the area. By questioning local residents, they were able to establish a thin timeline based on sightings of Christine. It's believed she arrived home prior to 4 p.m., bringing in the mail, leaving her backpack, and then going back out. Between 4 and 4.30, several witnesses reported seeing Christine walking towards Main Street. One witness reported seeing Christine outside of a convenience store not far from the park where she was supposed to meet Leslie, though this sighting added to the confusion as it reportedly occurred between 3.45 and 3.50. Either way, police began to theorize that Christine had likely disappeared either after leaving the convenience store and heading back home, or perhaps along her way to the park. Early on in the search, authorities classified the case as that of an abduction. Multiple tips were called in describing different vehicles with young women fitting Christine's description in them, but police weren't able to verify any of those tips. With police determining this was an abduction and not a situation of a lost child or a runaway, they began questioning friends, family, and neighbors. They very quickly began zeroing in on a man named Guy Paul Marin. There didn't appear to be any evidence pointing towards Marin, so it was more about the fact that people described him as strange and withdrawn. Beyond that, Marin played clarinet and Christine had a recorder, so it was considered possible this could have been used as a way for Marin to engage Christine in conversation. As the investigation into Marin heated up, police utilized a tracking dog which indicated a hit on the family's car. After being granted permission to search, police retrieved fibers which were sent out for examination. While investigators began to believe that Marin was their man, one major problem developed. He had a very solid alibi. Marin had clocked out of work at 3.32 p.m. Not long after, a clerk at a local store confirmed that he had stopped it and purchased a ticket for the lottery. After that, Marin went to the grocery store and shopped for his family as well as filling the car's gas tank. According to Marin's brother-in-law, he arrived home between 5 and 5.30, at which time he took a nap, waking around 6.30 when he then began working with his father on some projects around the house, never leaving the house again that night. Police felt the times were inaccurate, arguing that the family was either wrong or was lying to cover up for him, but they were never able to produce any evidence to contradict the statements. At that time, the investigation seemed to stall. Police had no new evidence and no major leads to track, which is perhaps why they focused on Marin so hard. He was all they had, even though in reality, they had nothing on him. Sadly, months began passing with no news. Then, on December 31st, 1984, nearly three months after Christine vanished, her remains were discovered. Court documents indicate that Christine was found on the border between the regions of York and Durham to the northeast of Toronto, approximately 56 kilometers from Christine's home. Medical examination would later determine that the nine-year-old had been beaten and stabbed multiple times. The stabs had been so violent and brutal that the child had been nearly decapitated, and her beating had been so extensive that several vertebrae had been broken. There was also evidence that Christine had been sexually assaulted, 
and semen was recovered from her underwear. Investigators determined that Christine had likely been abducted and sexually assaulted at a different location and that her body was placed at the scene and disturbingly posed by her killer. Due to the temperatures and outdoor exposure, Christine had been subject to extensive decomposition. When Christine was finally laid to rest, investigators noted that while almost everyone in town had come to pay their respects, Guy Paul Marin had not, which made him even more suspicious to them. Less than five months later, in April of 1985, the Durham Regional Police, who had taken over the case based on the location of where Christine had been found, charged Marin with the abduction, assault, and murder of Christine Jessup. This arrest came after multiple police interviews with the suspect, in which investigators found his behavior suspect and Marin's own admission that he had knowledge of the particular location where Christine had been found. Famed profiler John Douglas had delivered a profile which it felt fit Marin to a T, a white male, a loner, in his early to mid-twenties. The trial was, for lack of a better description, an absolute circus. The media cashed in on hyperbolic statements made by both sides, and it wouldn't be until later that further details were revealed which showed that things may have been manipulated. The Jessup family had testified about the timeline, and in doing so had made some changes which would have allowed Marin to be the killer. The Jessup family later acknowledged that the Durham police had essentially informed them that they knew for a fact Marin was guilty, and they must have been wrong about their timeline, prompting the changes. Marin's lawyer argued that his client had mental health issues and could have committed the crime during a hallucination, but none of that mattered. The jury ultimately acquitted Marin, much to the shock of police and the Jessup family. There just wasn't enough evidence. An appeal was filed to the Supreme Court, and in 1988, a new trial was ordered to take place. While during the first trial, the media had piled on to Marin, accusing him of guilt, in this second trial, they defended his innocence. On July 30th, 1992, the new trial concluded and Marin was found guilty. Marin appealed and due to advances in technology, was exonerated in 1995. DNA testing during the late 80s was not where it would eventually get to, but by 1995, testing was able to confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt that the semen found in Christine's underwear did not belong to Marin. Beyond that, Christine's brother Kenny later testified that the police had encouraged the family to lie about the official timeline. Marin later received $1.2 million after winning a lawsuit for wrongful prosecution. Marin being cleared led to a major problem. Police had no other suspects to examine, and the case was once again open and cold. A new task force was established to dig into the case, during which time they managed to obtain more than 300 DNA samples from potential persons of interest, but they never found one for which there was a match. There were some suspects, but no evidence to link them. One man claimed his father had admitted to the crime prior to committing suicide. Others called in tips, but DNA wasn't able to link any potential suspect. Ultimately, they were left with a profile which defined their killer as being unorganized and sloppy, with a history of arson or cruelty to animals. John Douglas added that the killer was likely someone Christine knew, and that the child had likely gone along with him willingly. More than 30 years after her murder, Christine Jessup's killer would finally be identified in October of 2020. Toronto Interim Police Chief James Raymer stated on an October 9th press conference, that law enforcement had been able to identify the killer through the use of DNA recovered from Christine's underwear. According to the CBC, the DNA was delivered to Othram, a United States lab which deals in DNA analysis and genetic research. I was able to speak with Anthony Redgrave, the lead forensic genealogist and instructional designer for Redgrave Research Forensic Services. Mr. Redgrave explained that, his team had previously worked with one of the detectives on Christine's case through the DNA Doe project, and after they signed with Othram, they were able to receive the materials and begin working more. Mr. Redgrave explained, quote, My team of forensic genetic genealogists received the DNA profile for the perpetrator on GED match and began analyzing his genetic cousins and their family tree to piece the puzzle together of their familial relationships. 
By doing family trees for dozens of cousins, we were able to triangulate where to be looking for a person of interest inside of all of those many trees and the places they overlap. It took about six months of research by six genealogists. End quote. On August 7th, Mr. Redgrave and his team identified a man as being the most likely candidate, at which time their evidence was turned over to the Toronto police, who would be required to verify this identification through their routine investigative procedures. The man identified was Calvin Hoover, a Toronto resident who was 28 at the time of Christine's murder. Hoover had taken his own life in 2015, and Toronto police were able to access his DNA, confirming the identification of the killer. This was announced in the October press conference. Mr. Redgrave explained that he and his team had been informed about the confirmed identification just days prior to the press conference, telling me, quote, It was a huge relief. We felt driven to come to a candidate for ID, knowing how long the family had been waiting for answers, and that Mr. Marin had also suffered while the case remained unsolved. The case, overall, was a more difficult one than average for us but we all pushed hard to come up with an ID. We never stopped. When someone was sleeping, someone else was working. We don't submit a candidate for identification until we are as close to 100% sure as we can be, but it's not officially solved until the department follows through on conventional confirmation procedures. So, the two months from when we submitted Hoover as a candidate to when he was confirmed by the department was nerve-wracking, even though we were totally confident. End quote. Details about the killer himself are still somewhat thin, and the police continue to investigate, trying to determine his movements over the past 36 years, as well as trying to discover the potential that he may have more victims. We do know that Hoover had a connection to the Jessup family, as his wife, at the time of the murder, worked for Christine's father, Bob. This has raised a lot of red flags, not only for the family, but for the public at large. Christine's older brother, Kenny, when speaking with The Star, expressed some of the family's frustration, saying, quote, This was somebody so close to our family, and they supposedly investigated everybody and all their movements. How did they miss this? End quote. Kenny added a disturbing detail, noting that police had been made aware early in the investigation that Hoover's then wife was one of the few people who was aware that Christine would be home alone that day pointing out that that detail was in fact in the official missing persons report. So how did police never lock in on Hoover? That's a question being asked by Innocence Canada, a legal advocacy group who's working for an independent review into the investigation. It's believed that errors were made during the investigation, which not only led to the killer going unidentified for more than 30 years, but which also led to the wrongful prosecution of Marin, who was subject to multiple legal battles despite a startling lack of evidence. Kirk Mackin, co-president of Innocence Canada, told the Global News, quote, To now stint on a carefully targeted review of police failures would be a mockery of all this expense and the human misery caused by this awful case. End quote. It's been argued that Hoover, who was a member of the family's social circle, should have been more closely examined and any alibi provided should have been more thoroughly investigated. There are also questions about why Hoover was never asked to present DNA. Both Toronto Police and Ontario's Attorney General noted that the case is still active as they're investigating Hoover, and that any review which might come would not be initiated until following the conclusion of this case. As it stands right now, much of Hoover's life is a mystery to investigators, one which they're very much looking to solve. In hopes of gaining new information, police have established a tip line as well as an email address people can send information to. If anyone knew or was around Hoover throughout his life, police would like to hear from them. This was discussed at the October press conference, and I'll now play a clip from that press conference courtesy of the Toronto Police Service. Today I am joined by Staff Superintendent Peter Code from Detective Operations. He oversees the pillar that includes our homicide section and the officers responsible for investigating this case over the last 25 years. To provide an overview, it was October 3, 1984, when nine-year-old Christine Jessup went missing from her home in Queensville, Ontario, just north of Toronto and York Region. She was described as a girl who loved life, 
her family, school, and sports. Her face, as seen here today, was on every television set and every newspaper. Hundreds of community members assisted in searching for Christine. Tragically, on December 31, 1984, Christine was found in Sunderland, Ontario, in Durham region. She had been stabbed to death, and evidence that she had been sexually assaulted was located at the crime scene. The investigation, as we know, resulted in the arrest of Guy Paul Morin. He was acquitted at his first trial, found guilty of first-degree murder at his second trial, before a successful Crown appeal ultimately led to his acquittal in 1995 on fresh evidence that was submitted jointly by both the Crown and the Defence. At that time, the fresh evidence was DNA that conclusively established Guy Paul Morin was not the donor of semen stains found on Christine Jessup's underwear. I am not here today to revisit that historical investigation. We are fortunate to have had the very thorough public inquiry and resulting recommendations from Justice Kaufman. I am here because of the diligent work of Toronto Police investigators. On Friday, October 9, 2020, we positively confirmed the identification of the person responsible for the DNA sample found on Christine's underwear. Calvin Hoover of Toronto, Ontario, was 28 years old in 1984. He was known to the Jessup family at the time of Christine's disappearance. He died in 2015. However, if he, he were alive today, the Toronto Police Service would arrest Calvin Hoover for the murder of Christine Jessup. Today's announcement is only the first very important answer in this ongoing investigation. It has obviously generated many more questions, and we are asking for the public's help as we look for information about Calvin Hoover in an effort to create a timeline of his whereabouts and the last moments of Christine's life. It's a bitter ending for the Jessup family and for all who have been so deeply involved with and touched by Christine's story. The guilty party has been discovered, though the exact details of what happened that cold October day in 1984 remain unknown. We do know that Hoover was not only involved in searches for Christine, but was also present at the Jessup home on the night of her funeral. For their part, the Hoover family was shocked to discover the truth, and according to the police, they have been extremely cooperative in providing whatever information they can about Hoover's life and movements. For the Jessup family, this provides them with some sense of closure, though justice will remain elusive, as Hoover took his own life five years before he could be arrested and charged. Kenny told Toronto.com, quote, I am overjoyed for Christine. I am happy no one can point fingers at Guy Paul. I am happy for myself, but the person I am happiest for is my mom. She was starting to believe she would never know. For the first time in 36 years, she won't go to bed praying to find out who killed her daughter. It's a miracle. I can't find another word for it. End quote. Perhaps now the lingering question is why? Why would Hoover do this to Christine? That is an answer which may never be truly known. There was, of course, also Guy Marin himself. On the morning of the press conference, two police officers arrived at the Marin home to personally deliver the news. Marin, not wanting to say much publicly, did make one statement explaining, quote, I am relieved for Christine's mother, Janet, and her family, and hope this will give them some peace of mind. They've been through a dreadful ordeal for 36 years since they lost Christine in 1984. I am grateful that the Toronto police stayed on the case and have now finally solved it. When DNA exonerated me in 1995, I was sure that one day DNA would reveal the real killer, and now it has. End quote. DNA has solved some truly baffling cases, many of them older than Christine's. Hopefully, as we move forward, more cold cases will be broken open and more families will be provided with answers. While nothing can bring back Christine or many victims of unsolved cases, this at least provides the possibility that answers will eventually be found. I do wish Hoover hadn't taken his life, as I would like to have seen him tried and sentenced for this horrible crime. However, perhaps now, the Jessup family can deal with the pain and tragedy of her loss with at least knowing after so long who was responsible. Closure, though, may be something which comes only with time, 
And while new emotions are high about identifying the killer, there will never be an answer as to why such a horrible crime was committed and how someone could commit such a heinous act against a child. As mentioned during the update, police are seeking further information regarding the killer, Calvin Hoover. Some information is known about him. He was 28 years old at the time of the murder in 1984 and was living in Toronto while married to his first wife, Heather. In 1996, he was arrested for driving under the influence in Ajax, Ontario. He eventually remarried a woman named Joanne, who passed away in 2009 in Waterdown, Ontario. Hoover himself committed suicide in 2015 in Port Hope, Ontario. If you have any information about Calvin Hoover, please contact the Toronto Police tip line at 416-808-7491. You can also send tips in via email to jessuptip at torontopolice.on.ca. 36 years is a long time to wait for answers but the Jessup family as well as Queensville now have them. Hopefully, over time, we'll receive more answers, though I don't think anything is ever going to explain why crimes like this happen and why horrible people like Calvin Hoover exist. Before closing, I wanted to give a special thank you to Anthony Redgrave of Redgrave Research Forensic Services for taking the time to discuss this case with me and for his team's extensive work in helping identify Christine's killer. I'll be releasing a full-length interview with Mr. Redgrave sometime within the next few months. Next week, Trace Evidence will return to our normal schedule, so I hope you'll join me then for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.